This video is about colligative properties. You should already be able to explain and calculate concentrations of solutions because we're going to be using those concentrations to describe changes in freezing point, boiling point, and vapor pressure, and as well as osmosis, and talk about how those um, changes are due to their changes in intermolecular forces of attraction. So the question of the video is about self-freezing soda, and you can do this at home if you watch closely. With this one simple trick, you'll be able to take any bottle of soda and pour out an instant slush around the front cap. Now, if you don't believe what you're seeing, that's okay. But it is real, and in this project, you'll discover the insanely easy secret to making an instant soda slush. For this project, grab a bottle of room temperature soda and start shaking it violently. We want as much pressure to build up inside as we can get. Now I've done this with these 500 milliliter bottles sent from the freezer for 3 hours and 15 minutes. This is the point when they're colder than freezing, but not actually frozen. Now you can show your friends that it's just a normal soda, but watch what happens when we simply release the pressure, tighten the cap, and turn it upside down. In just three seconds, the entire bottle is turned into an iced soda slush. Pour it in a glass, and you'll get a good idea of how thick the slush really is. And when it starts pushing up at the top, you can see it's a light and fluffy, delicious carbonated ice. So we're going to describe that using colligative properties. Uh, colligative properties depend only on their number of solute particles present and not on the identity of the solute particles. So it doesn't matter if it's sugar or salt or other types of salt. It should, it's more about how many particles there are. Not that they're potassium or sodium, but that they are, there's a certain number of those particles. So the first of the colloidal properties is called vapor pressure lowering. And if you actually memorize the names of the particles, the ideas, then you already know what's going to happen, kind of, right? Um, so because of the solute-solvent interaction, um, there's higher concentrations of the solute make it harder for the solvent to escape the vapor phase. So if you look at the first picture, this is just water alone, and it's escaping, becoming a gas. The gas is pushing on a U-tube that makes the difference in what used to be mercury, but it's probably you know, more like alcohol or something like that else, making that U-tube displace. So it used to be like equal levels, and now the gas particles are pushing the molecules of the other comp composition here, gray, um, up so that there's a displacement. But when you add a solute to it, notice it's green now, there's less solvent particles. Remember, there used to be quite a bit, and now there's a lot fewer. So they'll push the new, let's say, mercury up less. So the vapor pressure, or the gas particles pushing on each other, is much decreased because they're kind of stuck in the solution. So the vapor pressure of the solution is lower than that of the pure solvent. This works best when both solutions have nearly identical intermolecular forces. So if you're trying to get the water to not evaporate, you need to mix it with something that also has hydrogen bonds. If you're talking about hexane and how it's nonpolar, hexane is made of C's and H's, which is why it's nonpolar, um, you would need to add something that is similar um, intermolecular force, which would also have London dispersal forces. So Raoult's law looks an awful lot like the pressure pressure rules that we did for gases, where Xa is the mole fraction of the compound, and Pa is the pressure or normal vapor pressure of that substance. So if you want to figure out how your pressure is going to change, you'll be using the mole fraction of the gas. Uh, make sure that the vapor pressure of the solvents is there. Um, so A is representing a solvent, so therefore the um, mole fraction has to be of the solvent, because we're like this, we're looking at evaporating, not the solute, and especially because a lot of solutes tend to be solids or gases, not necessarily liquids. Um, so if the example was given, calculate the vapor pressure of a solution formed when one mole of sodium chloride is dissolved in three moles of water SCP, where the normal vapor pressure of the water is 0 0.006 atmospheres, we would set up our calculation, and the mole fraction of the water, or the solvent, was three out of a total of four. Remember, we're doing the solvent. That number goes in for X, and then the uh, pressure of that substance is 0 0.006, so we take three-fourths of it, and we just find out the new pressure is now 0.0045. Notice the pressure decreased as you added solute. So the solvent used to be 0.006, and now it's only 0.0045. So just proof that it decreases. And this is just the same calculation we did for gas laws, except for it's for solvents. So make sure you have your solvent as your numerator. 
Next, some substances form semi, have semipermeable membranes, allowing some smaller particles to pass through, but blocking other large particles. I kind of think of your skin, right? Your skin kind of allows, if you put like lotions and oils through it, um, the skin allows a lot of d different things into it, but it doesn't allow um, more solid type particles, right? That the particles are more closely packed. Um, so if you look at this, this is a, another U-tube with a semi-permeable membrane, meaning that it allows only certain solutions through. And right now you have a concentrated solution on the left side, which is why it's darker, and a dilute solution on the right side, which is why it's lighter. And if you give it time and you get pressure, the particles will start to displace and move through the barrier. What's moving through the barrier is actually the easier particle, the solvent. Um, so you, therefore, you have to move your solvent to um, the concentrated side, to make it more dilute. The solute particles are not moving through the membrane, so you can see the green parts, are not moving through the membrane because they're too large for the membrane. And so the um, osmotic pressure that you can push on it, see there's a little piece right there, would stop it from moving. So if you want to keep a certain particles concentrated on one side but dilute on the other, you have to add a pressure. In biological systems, most semipermeable membranes allow water to pass through, but the solutes still can't, like salts and sugars. So the osmotic pressure is the pressure needed to stop that movement, where M is the molarity of the solution, and then R and T, R is your constant, and T is the temperature at which this is happening. So the hotter it is, the more you have your movement. The reason when you talk about this is it's osmosis in blood cells. So if the solute concentration outside the cell is greater than inside the cell, the water will move out of the cell. And so the cell will start to look like it's shrinking because it's losing its water, or it's dehydrating. If the solute concentration outside the cell is less than inside the cell, the water will flow into the cell and it will bloat the cell. So this is why there's a perfect amount of water that you should be drinking. If you drink too little water, your um, blood vessels might like, collapse and you'll feel dehydrated. But if you drink too much water, they'll bloat. And there's actually studies or actually um, news articles where people have drank so much water that they actually in turn drown themselves um, from this process. But usually the properties depend on if they're electrolytic or not, electrolytes or not. So those last two properties didn't really matter, but the next two properties they don't. So they do. So since these properties depend on the number of particles involved, the solutions of electrolytes, which dissolve in solution and part break up, show greater changes than those that are not electrolytes. And it also depends, like we said, on molarity, how much you're using. So in the first example, you're seeing salt particles as plus and minuses. When the water comes in, they actually break into two particles, pluses separate from the minuses. And notice I love this picture because the pluses are butting up to the negative oxygens and the negatives are butting up to the positive hydrogens. So it's a very pretty picture, I think. So instead of it being one particle, um, salts actually behave as two. Whereas covalent things are attracted to the water, but they make one big particle. They don't break into particles. So if we're talking about numbers of particles, covalent things still count as a one. But ionic things might count as two, three, four, five ions, depending on how many break up. So that's discussed as the Van Hoff factor, which is represented by an I. I like to think that the I means how many ions you have, or like little particles. So if you found the Van Hoff factor, or how many times it's going to influence our collision properties for calcium chloride, the calcium is going to separate and be attracted to the oxygen parts of the water. And two chlorines will separate to form to be attracted to the hydrogen parts of the water. So there will actually be three separate particles. In NaF, there'll be two. In Mg3 and 2, there'll be five. So we're kind of kind of just counting up the subscripts. But then watch out for things like this, where some students would be, there's 18. The thing is, this is covalent. So it's actually only one particle. There'll be no separation between Cs and Hs, because we don't have a metal ion and a non-metal ion, or a positive cation and any given anion to separate. So two more examples that really depend on those Van Hoff factors are boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. Um, with these, again, if you memorize the name of it, you kind of have an idea what's going to happen. So the solute-solvent interactions cause sol solutions to have higher boiling points than normal and lower freezing points than normal. And so if you look at the pictures, I have ice cream where there's um, the milk is resisting freezing and it will freeze instead of at zero degrees, it may be something lower. And if your freezer is not that low, then it won't freeze. Or boiling point elevation, where if you add enough salt, which has to be quite a bit, um, the water will not boil at 100, but maybe boil at 110. And in that case, things like pasta will go, cook, cook faster. So the boiling point elevation depends on what you're trying to change, right? So they have a list here of boiling points. 
and they have lists of uh, the different substances. And their values, um, Kb, is a boiling point constant. And it's also dependent on how much you add. The more you add, the better this will occur. So like I said, you had to add a quite a bit of salt in order for the boiling point to increase. So that a little m is molality, if you remember from a previous part. The more molality you have and the more ions you have, the more change in boiling point you'll get. Similarly, you have freezing point depression in their values. So that is working the same way. It's based on the molality because remember, you don't want molarity that's temperature dependent and we're changing the temperature. So we want moles per kilogram times its constant, that's dependent on what substance it is, and how many ions you have. So again, the more concentrated the solution is, the more ions it has, the more the freezing point will decrease. So at this point, um, if we go back to the picture in the video, um, the gas does not usually dissolve in soda, right? And so if you um, want it to, you keep it cold, right? Now, that kind of comes into play that when we open up the particles, the gas tries to leave the solution, right? That was like our last video about how gases are better contained if it's cold, which it was, but also if it's under high pressure, which only occurs when the tap, cap is on. As soon as you let the cap open, the gas tries to escape because of the low pressure system. And if it escapes, now you have less particles dissolving in the solution. And if there's less particles dissolving the solution, that means that the freezing point goes back to normal. So instead of it freezing at a lower temperature, it's going to freeze zero at zero degrees. And that bottle was just in a zero degree freezer, so it wants to freeze. And so the only thing that was keeping it from freezing was those gas particles. As soon as the gas particles leave, the, the, gas, the soda started to freeze. So I thought it was kind of neat. The video kind of um, correlates our video before to this video now. At this point, you should be able to describe changes in freezing point, boiling point, vapor pressures, and osmosis using concentrations and intermolecular forces of attraction.